on World News Tonight. Overflowed India, flooded victims struggle for food and drinking water as many of them flee to safer areas. New rains, Australia ousts Conservatives after nine years and welcome their new Prime Minister as he sets off to work immediately. Monkeypox spreads, WHO calls emergency meetings as cases of virus rise and now detected in several nations. And peddling away. Russell Stone's leisure boat peddling into a championship, making it the world's first peddler championship. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with neighboring India. Victims in India's northeastern flood-ravaged Assam state said that they have been deprived of flood, food and clean water, drinking water as the floodwaters entered their houses and damaged property. Pre-monsoon heavy rains have caused River Brahmaputra and its distributaries to swell, which has severely hit and daily lives of people, causing many hundreds of thousands of them to flee to safer areas. With no food, drinking water and scanty relief, the victims are struggling each day to survive. Wading through the floodwaters, villagers' homes were inundated by the flooding. Some were sleeping in makeshift shelters built on higher ground. More than 800,000 people have fled their homes to escape heavy floods, which inundated more than 200,000 villagers since last month after the flood started. The state of the Assam has reported floods every year in recent times. One of the main reasons behind this is the eroding banks of the Brahmaputra River, which makes it difficult to hold access water during monsoon. Ukraine ruled out a ceasefire or any territorial concessions to Moscow as Russia stepped up its attack in the eastern and southern parts of the country, pounding the Donbas and Miklovev regions with airstrikes and artillery fire. Camouflaged among the leaves, a Ukrainian artillery unit in the embattled Donbas region stands ready to join the fight against invading Russian forces. Volodymyr Dumansky is a member of the unit. We are ready for any development of events. We are ready to attack, ready to defend, ready to retreat if necessary. We are ready for anything. The Donbass is the focal point of current hostilities in Ukraine. Russia is waging a major offensive in Luhansk, one of two provinces in Donbass. Russian forces attacked Ukraine almost three months ago in what President Vladimir Putin called a special military operation to remove what it called dangerous nationalists from power. Ukraine and Western governments dismissed this justification as false and accused Russia of launching an unprovoked invasion. A spokesperson from the Russian Defense Ministry on Sunday said artillery and airstrikes pummeled Ukrainian targets. Russian forces have been trying to seize the eastern region since mid-April after an initial push to capture Kiev failed in the face of Ukrainian resistance. As the fighting moves east, Kiev appears to have hardened its stance on negotiations. Ukraine on Sunday ruled out a ceasefire or any territorial concessions to Russia. The chief of staff to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky tweeted, The war must end with the complete restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Zelensky met with Polish leader Andrzej Duda on Sunday. Duda spoke to the Ukrainian parliament, saying Warsaw backed Kiev in demanding a full Russian withdrawal. Here in the forest, among the artillery shells and Javelin anti-tank missiles, this team of artillerymen find a moment to laugh before the fighting resumes. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison conceded defeat after early election results showed his Liberal-led coalition had failed to win a majority. Labour have returned to power for the first time since 2007, and Prime Minister-elect Anthony Albanese in his election victory speech promised sharper uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions while he, the facts are early foreign policy tests. Supplying a wave of support for candidates who campaigned for more action on climate change, Australia's Labour Party is set to oust the Conservatives after nearly a decade. Labour leader Anthony Albanese will become the new Prime Minister. My Labour team will work every day to bring Australians together. And I will lead a government worthy of the people of Australia. A government as courageous and hardworking and caring 
as the Australian people are themselves. Partial results showed Labor had made small gains, but incumbent Prime Minister Scott Morrison's Liberal National Coalition have been punished by voters in Western Australia and affluent urban seats. In results so far, Labor had yet to reach the 76 seats needed to form a majority government. The final results could take time as counting of a record number of postal votes is completed. Outgoing PM Scott Morrison, who held the post since 2018, said it had been a difficult night and that he would be stepping down as party leader. I've always believed in Australians and their judgment and I've always been prepared to accept their verdicts. And tonight they have delivered their verdict and I congratulate Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party and I wish him and his government all the very best. Albanese is a pragmatic leader from a working class background. He's pledged to end divisions in the country, bring in constitutional recognition and parliamentary representation for Indigenous Aboriginals and establish an anti-corruption commission. Albanese will face a parliament that looks to be much less climate sceptic than the previous one. The Greens and a group of so-called teal independents who campaigned on policies of gender equality and tackling climate change put on a strong showing, tapping voter anger over inaction on the environment after some of the worst floods and fires to hit Australia. U.S. President Joe Biden is now in Japan after wrapping up his three-day South Korean tour before taking off for Japan. Presidents Yoon and Biden concluded their final day together demonstrating the country's ironclad security alliance. U.S. President Joe Biden ended his visit to South Korea on Sunday, his first trip to Asia as president, raising both business interests back home as well as security matters in the region. Biden spoke at a news conference after a meeting with Hyundai's chair executive over the car manufacturer's plans to invest in the U.S. through 2025. Such as robotics, urban air mobility, autonomous driving and AI as well as a new plant in Georgia that is expected to house electric vehicle and battery facilities. It's great to be here to announce the more than $10 billion in new investment in American manufacturing. This new commitment of $5 billion for advanced automotive technology and $5.5 billion investment open a new factory near Savannah, Georgia, is going to create more than 8,000 new American jobs. Biden also said he was not concerned over intelligence reports that said Pyongyang was preparing for its first nuclear tests in nearly five years. We thought through how we respond to whatever they do, and so I am not concerned if that's what you're suggesting. A day earlier, Biden and his new South Korean counterpart, President Yoon Suk-yeol, discussed bigger joint military exercises and deploying more nuclear-capable American weapons in response to the North's weapons tests. So far, Pyongyang has not responded to U.S. overtures, though a senior U.S. official says that could be due to restrictions there related to the global health crisis. North Korea officially acknowledged its first outbreak earlier this month. Ukraine is on top of the agenda for the world's business and political elite gathering in the Swiss mountain resort of Davos, which kicks off in the earnest with a video address by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. At the last in-person World Economic Forum in January 2020, the world was a very different place. Donald Trump was president of the United States and a keynote speaker. COVID-19 had not yet rocked the global economy, and the sleepy ski resort town of Davos had turned, like every year, into a winter wonderland of mingling A-listers. From Britain's Prince Charles to Greta Thunberg to the world's top business executives, they came to speak, to see, and to be seen. After a virtual summit in 2021, this year Davos has a different backdrop. First, it's spring, the Omicron virus having postponed the normally winter summit. This year's edition is entitled History at a Turning Point. As the global economy still grapples with climate change, but also surging inflation, COVID disruptions and the war in Ukraine. At last year's online forum, Vladimir Putin was a keynote speaker. This year, the Russian delegation has not been invited. This year, Vladimir Zelensky, who's participated before, will kick off the four-day summit via video link. More than 50 government leaders will join some 2,500 delegates. They'll discuss a wide range of topics, from rising energy prices to poverty to the metaverse. 
With its first edition in 1971, the organizers and participants say the forum remains a consequential gathering of minds. But critics say it is a festival of wealth steeped in hypocrisy. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, there is a new alarming virus that is spreading concern as the WHO also conducted emergency meetings. Europe and North America are seeing cases of monkeypox. The virus originated in Africa, but scientists are baffled as new outbreaks show no obvious route of transmission. A new concern for health officials, the spread of monkeypox. As we speak, our colleagues around the world are responding to outbreaks of Ebola in DRC, monkeypox, and hepatitis of unknown cause. Symptoms include fever, chills, and lesions on the face and genitals. Until recently, most infections occurred in Central and Western Africa. But in the past week, Europe and North America have been seeing outbreaks. According to the World Health Organization, 92 cases of monkeypox have been found in 12 countries as of last Saturday. Norway and Israel found their first cases on Saturday as well. And 28 suspected cases are under investigation. This is not something that the general population should be worried about. We need to investigate. We need to limit the transmission and, and protect people. But this, this is not going to be the next COVID. Monkeypox is not a new virus. It was first discovered in the 1950s among monkeys. And the first case of human transmission was found in 1970. The disease is usually contracted through bites, scratches, or from the meat of wild game. And although person-to-person -person transmissions are rare, they can happen through close contact or with an exchange of fluids or contaminated items. But the recent strains have been found among people who have not been in touch with African wild game and who hadn't visited Africa. This has left scientists baffled. What's unusual is to have these numerous cities, two continents um, so far involved at the same time. Fortunately, to date, there have been no reported deaths. The reported U.S. and European cases are a type of monkeypox that has milder symptoms. But with no proven treatment and an unclear route of transmission, scientists are still concerned. And according to President Biden on Sunday, scientists are working hard to figure out how best to respond. More than 36 million people in the United States spent their evenings broiling under a record-breaking heat wave. A new study highlights the dangers of extreme heat and reveals that older adults and black Americans are significantly impacted. A sweltering heat wave. It's like an oven. I'm like so hot. Hammering more than half of the U.S. And it's not even Memorial Day yet. As this weekend melted away record temperatures. 92 degrees in Washington, D.C. and Richmond. And 93 in Atlantic City, New Jersey. A stunning contrast to parts of the Rockies, where late May snow dumped up to 20 inches in Colorado. There you go, Corey. That same storm system then spawning tornadoes in Michigan. And tonight, it's eyeing the eastern seaboard with potential thunderstorms. But not before crowds soaked up the sunshine at the shore. We've been at the beach all day. While hot weather is welcomed by some as an early start to summer, a new study underscores its dangers. The more days with extreme heat, the more deaths, with the greatest impact on older adults, men, and black Americans. This weekend's dramatic turn in temperature came just as some 20,000 runners hit the pavement in Brooklyn Saturday. One runner died and another 16 were hospitalized, but authorities have not reported the cause. We have some good news for you. A type of urban farming technique called aquaponics allows farmers to grow eco-friendly vegetables by combining the techniques of fish raising agriculture with hydroponics. An abundance of fresh vegetables grow on the first floor of a shopping mall in a downtown residential area. They're grown using hydroponics, a slightly different method of using water to cultivate plants. Meanwhile, this urban farm utilizes aquaponics, a technique that uses excrement from fish raised in the tank next to the vegetables as nutrients. In this tank, there are around 80 carp and 1,000 koi. 
The tank's water that contains the excrement and microorganisms is supplied to the vegetables to act as natural fertilizer. The fish excrement in the water helps the vegetables grow, and when the plant roots purify the water, that water is recirculated to the fish tank. This is a 100 percent natural and sustainable farming method. The vertical arrangement of this small urban smart farm maximizes space. An ordinary farm would need six times the amount of land to cultivate the amount of vegetables that's grown on six shelves or six tiers of an aquaponics farm. The farm we see now grows nine different vegetables that are ingredients for wraps or salads. Most are used to make school meals because they're organic and eco-friendly. As a response to global warming and extreme weather, we plan to promote urban aquaponics smart farms so that the stable production of vegetables is guaranteed all year. Managed by one urban farmer alone, this smart farm usually sees annual sales of almost 100 million won, or roughly 78,000 U.S. dollars. Along with substantial revenue, the biggest advantage of this aquaponic smart farm is that it can make use of the most of limited space in the city while also providing a stable supply of high-quality vegetables. Boeing Starliner capsule docks with the International Space Station for the first time after more than two years of delays in a program designed to give NASA another vehicle for sending into orbit. Nine meters to the International Space Station. Boeing Starliner capsule arrives safely at the International Space Station Friday after a do over test flight and more than two years of delays and costly engineering setbacks. About 30 minutes after Thursday's liftoff from Cape Canaveral, the Starliner had reached its intended preliminary orbit. It was at that point during its 2019 test flight that a software glitch effectively foiled the spacecraft's ability to reach the space station. But the capsule's flight to orbit this time around was not without a hitch. Two of the 12 onboard thrusters failed during the Starliner's 45-second orbital insertion maneuver, according to NASA. Officials said a backup thruster kicked in and that the malfunction should not prevent the spacecraft from returning safely to Earth. The uncrewed capsule carried cargo for astronauts and a research mannequin dressed in a blue flight suit named Rosie the Rocketeer. It's set to spend four to five days attached to the space station. Rosie's job is to collect data on crew cabin conditions during the journey. A successful mission will move the long-delayed Starliner a major step closer to providing NASA with a second reliable means of ferrying astronauts to and from the space station. Since resuming crewed flights to orbit from American soil in 2020, NASA has had to rely solely on the Falcon 9 rockets and Crew Dragon capsules from Elon Musk's company SpaceX to fly its astronauts. Previously, the only other option for reaching the orbital laboratory was by hitching rides aboard the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. NASA's chief told Reuters hours before liftoff, quote, having a backup is important to the country. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Female presenters on TV stations in Afghanistan go on air with covered faces in the line with the new Taliban orders seen as a return to a signature policy of their past hardline rule and as an escalation of restrictions and of causing anger at home and abroad. The first shipment of baby formula from Europe arrived in the United States as part of the Biden administration's plan to address a critical nationwide shortage. A U.S. federal judge blocked plans by the Biden administration to lift Title 42, a COVID policy that empowers agents at the Mexican border to turn back migrants without giving them a chance to seek asylum. Shanghai reopened a small part of the world's longest subway system after some liners were closed for almost two months as the city works towards lifting in painful COVID lockdowns. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi held meetings with top Japanese business leaders ahead of the Quad Leaders Summit between the United States, Japan, India and Australia. Europe's tallest active volcano Mount Etna put on a stunning display with lava and smoke spewing meters up into the sunset sky and lava flowing down the mountain during the night heading for the Lion Valley.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with over 200 people participating in the world's first Pablo Championship in Brussels. Thank you for watching us again. Stay safe and have a good night.